everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited. I've got my good friend, Dr. Mary Claire Haver, board certified ob guy, menopause expert, overall nice person, amazing <laughs> businesswoman, mom, all the things. And we met from a fitness group mm -hmm. way back when, pre-COVID fitness group. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming on my podcast. Thanks for having me. You just put out a new book, which is going bonkers, and it's called The Galveston Diet. And mm -hmm. it's awesome. This is... I mean, again, you know, diet with diet, all the things, but this is a lifestyle. I, I read right. the book and I'm like, this is a lifestyle. This is how to live your best life. This is how, how do, who do I want to be when I'm 75? There's great tips in here to get you the best person you want to be when you're 75. How to age well, I, basically. If, if I could do anything over again, I would have taken the word diet out of it. You know, it started organically as a way to counsel my patients and you, you and I know in medicine, diet is a pattern of eating. It's not a fad or, you know, and little did I know that it would become a book and an online program and, you know, be shown to millions of people who immediately dismiss it as toxic diet culture without even opening, cracking the book. So thank you for saying that because it really is I, what I meant it to be was kind of a, a, a blueprint for how to eat, how to move, how to live so we can be as healthy as possible, you know, utilizing those tools in our, in our menopause transition. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's so much crap out there in the supermarket, right? Like literally we exist on packaged food and it's like, we do need somebody to be like, get back to the basics, get back to like, I heard it the other day. Somebody was saying, uh, one, one, one word food stuff. Like if it's got one ingredient, one ingredient food stuff. And I'm like, well, that's a simple way of saying fruits, vegetables, and protein, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like clean it up because there's so much crap out there. Mm-hmm. What do you find I mean, is like the, no... go ahead. I was saying, what do you find is the biggest hurdle for people to like eat healthy? I think it was, is time. I, one, I think that we get away with stuff when we're younger and we build our lives around convenience. And I certainly did it for myself, for my children. And that, you know, you found this, this kind of system that works for you and you felt healthy and you look good and you know, you checked all the boxes and then it stops working in midlife and you go through this era of frustration of what is wrong with me, where you're aging, not only are you aging chronologically, but our endocrine system, you know, our, our, our ovaries are aging at an accelerated rate. And suddenly what you were doing before is no longer working. And it's hitting that brick wall when everything in society, everything in medicine, every, not every personal trainer, but you know, is saying this has to work. And it's, it's getting over that frustration. We build our lives around the convenience of food. You know, we overschedule ourselves. And then when that convenience is no longer working, we're not healthy. Um, and it's like, wait, I don't understand. I don't understand what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I think another thing is like we set up our, our palates, right? Like I get mm -hmm. super used to caramel lattes and I've been doing it since college and blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, I really like it. And it's like, well, of course you like this junk you've been feeding yourself, right? You've been giving it to yourself for decades. And like how do coming off of that, right? And coming off and rethinking right. about food as like really medicine, right? Or support right. or fuel, thinking about it in a different way uh, instead of thinking about it as like a reward or a treat or it's just fast, like all these things that end up not serving us. Mm -hmm. And not to say that, you know, there's not room for an occasional latte or an occasional, you know, something packed, we get in a rush or, you know, but it's like building your life so that 85% mm, of the time you're not relying on that convenient stuff so that that just becomes emergency food or a treat or it, it is a rare treat or something that, you know, or a celebration or you're just stuck in a social situation you can't get out of, but that that, that doesn't, become what is normal to you and, and every yeah. day because it's not going to serve you. Yeah. Like 2 p.m. every day is your soy, soy caramel latte. You're like, ah, oh, it might be, it might be a pattern. To, candy was mine when I was in clinic. 2 p.m. Yeah. candy. hundred percent. Had I had some peanut M&Ms yesterday. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that what your book is all about is really like, I was thinking, you know, this podcast, majority of it still about sex, talk a lot about menopause. But it's like everything you're talking about in the book is basically going to help you have better sex because we have so much data now that like eating well, getting sleep, exercising, feeling good in your body, being confident, all of that leads to a better sex life. And like we can't negate the importance of our lifestyle in our sex life. So when I start breaking down sexual function, all of which I learned from you, by the way, and not from my OBGYN residency, <laughs> Um, 
When I start counseling them, you know, a lot of my patients are absolutely honest with themselves and say, you know, I am struggling with desire and I don't know how much of it is a part of, I don't like the way I feel in my body right now. I don't feel confident. I don't feel beautiful. I'm uncomfortable. And that is not making me feel desirable, you know, Mm -hmm. so that part of my brain can't go on. And so we, we have discussions around that and, you know, that that's a huge part of it. And then, you know, they're coming in months later after making all these changes, adopting new habits, they're feeling so good. They're sleeping all the things. And I'm like, you know, do you still feel like we could try some medication here? And she's like, no, no, I'm good. You know, not to say there's not a place for medication or or other, you know, other interventions, but sometimes it is just getting the sleep, getting the stress reduction, eating the foods, you know, and you feel better. And then therefore that part of your mind opens up again. I love it. Dude, I mean, it's so wonderful that you shared in your book, your story, because I think, you know, if people look at you now and I met you, I met you now, not then, right. Of like, Mm -hmm. you truly had to figure this out on your own because it wasn't working. Can you share your story and kind of talk about your journey on getting to the point where you're like, the proof's in the pudding people. Like if it worked for me, I'm not special. It's going to work. It's going to work for other people. So I was a successful OBGYN in a academic practice. So I had, I basically took care of our community patients and the faculty patients at the hospital I was at. And I run the resident, I was one of the residency program directors. So I was super busy, kind of thrived on, you know, being able to wear so many hats. I had a husband, two kids. And then things kind of like the wrench got thrown. Um, we had a hurricane that wiped out our town of Galveston, Texas. Um, there was Katrina. And then, you know, a couple of years later we had Ike in Galveston. So that kind of like restructured everything about my job, my community, academic medicine was changing. We were having more and more layers of administration come in where I wasn't able to practice autonomously, autonomously. Like I used to, like my job satisfaction was going down. Same time I'm starting to go through perimenopause. And then my, my oldest brother, my oldest surviving brother, gets really, really sick. Like he'd been kind of struggling with, um, in stage, well, liver failure and HIV. And then his liver just kind of like, I didn't realize how bad it was. Like he got admitted to the hospital with esophageal varices, which as you know, is kind of in stage liver failure kind of stuff. And I remember telling my little girl, they were little at the time, you know, uncle Bob, um, may not live much longer, you know, and I, the words were coming out of my mouth, but I wasn't really registering what I was saying. Like the doctor was talking, not the mom or the sister. And so when we lost him, so we had a stroke and he basically had no more platelets and his, he bled in his brain. And then, you know, it was about a week touch and go. And then, then he died. And so I just was not ready. I was not prepared. I had not, you know, it was awful. And so in my grief from that, I had gotten off of birth control pills and I was fully full on menopausal. And I just thought it was grief or thought it was something else. I wasn't sleeping. I was, you know, hot flashing. I was doing all the things and to, to, um, make myself feel better. I was eating goldfish crackers by the like bucket full, just stuffing my mouth. When I get home from the office, I'd cry all the way home. I'd, you know, see my patients cry all the way on the drive home, walk into the pantry and just stuff, 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 grab a glass of wine and start making dinner. And, and then I would eat more stuff after dinner. I was just filling myself with processed food just to, to fill the void. So after a few months of that and the grief started lifting and I was, you know, trying to get my life back together, you know, realized I'm in menopause. Like I have, when's the last period? I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. Like it's been quite a while and I am miserable. And then had this gut that came out of nowhere. And I mean, you've known me, you've seen me work out. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a very frail looking thin person. And I kind of felt like Miss Potato Head because I had this enormous gut and like little tiny arms and legs. And I was like, whoa, whoa, you know? And so I was like, okay, time to get back healthy, back into shape. And I went back to all of the tricks and things that I had done to lose weight after having kids or whatever, work out more, eat less. And I'd lose a pound or two and then it would bounce right back on. Like nothing was sticking. And so being the type A person who was only taught work out more, eat less and totally believed that that was the way would double down. I had restricted down Kelly down to probably 900 calories a day. 
Like it's insane because I knew it had to work. And yes, I was kind of losing, but I was losing so much muscle that I didn't even have a lot to begin with, but anything to get that number on the scale to line up. And I just could not get there. And so finally my husband was like, and he was going on a big trip and he said, Hey, you know, and I said, you're going to have the wife you deserve when you get back. And he's like, I have the wife I deserve. I love you. I don't care what shape you are. I think you're beautiful, but that you're obsessed. Like I hear you getting up to pee in the middle of the night and I know you're getting on the scale, you know? And figure this out. You're a smart person, you know, like not every woman your age is, you know, you, you can figure this out. So I took that as a challenge, called up the PhD nutrition department, you know, at the university I was employed at and said, hey, what's going on with menopause? <laughs> because my patients are complaining about this. I'm now going through it. And I've been telling people a load of, you know, dung that they need to work out more or less because it's not working for me and it's not working for anybody else. And they said, well, there's something going on with inflammation. Start looking at these articles. There's body composition changes nobody's really talking about right now. And so, you know, in my research, I, I realized that women are gaining weight average about a pound to a pound and a half a year starting at age 35. And it levels off in their mid to late 60s. Okay. But what, so the weight is going up regardless of when they go into menopause. Okay. What's happening in menopause, and we see dramatically, is a loss of lean body mass and an increase of body fat. So our body composition is changing in relation to our endocrine aging, to our ovarian aging, okay? And so that makes us much less healthy. You lose muscle, you gain fat, your high risk of heart disease skyrockets, your risk of dementia, your risk of Alzheimer's, all of it, okay? And so I'm like, oh my God, what can we do about it? There's not a pill, there's no magic, it was all nutrition. So I looked at those studies that were lowering inflammation, lowering abdominal or visceral fat accumulation, and what could I do to make those changes. And everything was anti-inflammatory nutrition, very similar to Mediterranean diet. You know, that was kind of my, my touchstone really got interested in the research on Mark Matson from the NIH on intermittent fasting and its treatment of neuroinflammation, Alzheimer's and dementia. And I really got excited about micronutrients. No one ever taught me this in school. I knew about, defi we all knew about scurvy and severe deficiencies, but not, you know, like day to day, how, how fiber is important, how magnesium is important and, and vitamin D and, and how, you know, if we're not hitting those levels with food, we're really doing ourselves a disservice. Nothing's really working. So that's kind of like the crazy maelstrom in my mind of what was going on. So I literally on the back of an envelope wrote out a plan for myself and played with it and said, okay. And finally I was turning the corner, the gut was shrinking, the weight was coming off and I got back to the gym and was serious about it and was getting some of the muscle back. So, um, then I started telling my patients, started telling my girlfriends, the patients were telling their friends. I was making copies of my little plan at the local Kinko's or Office Depot, actually, down the street from my house, just giving it out to whoever wanted it. And then I took it to social media, and that's where it started ex exploding. Amazing. Can you talk about diet and how it can improve hot flashes? Is that, yeah, a, is that so, an inflammation pathway, same story? So we're not sure. You know, they're just now, there was an article that came out in Nat Ge National Geographic that we didn't really know exactly how, what hot flashes, like why no one's researched it in great. We just know they happen. Now there's some researchers and I forget where they're out of, but, um, had that have actually broken down like what exact part of the brain that hot flashes are forming. We've known for years that women who eat according to certain patterns or diets rich in X, Y, and Z have less hot flashes. Okay. Now, is it because the nutrient, exact nutrient profile is doing that, or is it the pattern, or is it that eating this way changes other parts of our physiology that decreases the risk of hot flashes? So things like diets rich in soy, diets rich in fiber, people who exercise regularly, people who do yoga regularly, all of those lead to less hot flashes. And so why would we care? I mean, yes, they're bothersome. They can be a tremendous quality of life, but super flashers, people who have severe hot flashes like multiple times a day that keep you up at night, you're at much higher risk for cardiovascular disease. You're at much higher risk for stroke. You're at much higher risk for earlier death than people who rarely have a hot flash. And we don't know if it's the hot flash or you have set yourself up nutritionally that you're not having hot flashes and that same nutritional profile is leading to your better health and less risk of chronic disease. Yeah, I love that you point that out because it's is the hot flash the flag, right? Of mm -hmm. like the health is not good or is it in and of itself the danger 
you know, the component. There's a, something uh, in your brain. Yeah. 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 And, and the other um, fascinating thing about hot flashes that I was reading is people who have, you know, the ACE, the adverse childhood events, you know, you can get mm-hmm. points by how, how, how many of ACEs you had as a child, right? Um, people who have higher ACE, uh, ACE numbers, so adverse childhood events, have worse hot flashes. To me, that's yes. fascinating. It's so fascinating to me as well. And the the role of like your mental health and trauma healing on, can that change your hot flash experience? And your, and overall your health and quality of life. I mean, it's finally someone cares enough to start doing the research, you know, and the research on the brain is more to do with pharmacology and some novel areas of, of medication that are non-hormonal for hot flash relief, um, which I get. So for women with breast cancer who can't take estrogen, I mean, this is huge for them because we just kind of have things that are okay. You know, the Neurontin and the Clonidine and, you know, other medications, SSRIs are not, nothing is works as good as estrogen. I can get almost anybody's hot flashes gone with estrogen. Yep. But our, you know, and we actually improve their quality of life, actually reduce their risk of heart disease as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Estrogen's ask- early, with early ways. estrogen intervention. Yeah. Yeah. It's not only helping the hot flashes, but it's helping decrease the cardiovascular risk. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's, I mean, the art, the, the Super Bowl commercial, right. About mm-hmm. menopause was from the pharmaceutical company that's coming out with the hot flash, the non-hormonal hot flash medication. Yeah. So that's, Estella, that's exciting. Estella. Estella. Is, Is it Estella? I think something. AX cool. something. Um, so, you know, all this talk about like inflammation and doctors like to measure things. Patients like to measure things. Is there a blood marker test for inflammation that is remotely accurate? Or do you just have to go in kind of thinking like, I think this is inflammation. Let's try an anti-inflammatory diet. So you can do either. So in my clinic, you know, I have a menopause clinic um, that I see patients and I do not accept insurance because I will never again be told by an insurance company what I can and can't do. And I'm in a very privileged position to be able to do that. Um, but one of the routine markers that I check is a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. The problem with those markers is that they're very nonspecific. Yes, you're inflamed, but we don't know why. And so the first thing I try is nutrition. We recheck in three months. And then if it's still elevated, that we start investigating other causes, you know, unless something's very, very clear. Like, you know, in my clinic, I have people, you know, menopausal symptoms are so varied, so wide, and we're so biodiverse. Every woman's walking in with a different constellation of symptoms. And a lot of things can overlap, like hypothyroidism or autoimmune disease or, you know, other inflammatory conditions, rheumatoid arthritis. I have diagnosed all of those things in my clinic, women coming in thinking it's menopause. And yes, they were menopausal, but they had, high, you know, I've diagnosed lupus twice this year and women who had no idea that, you know, and so I was just like, oh, early morning stiffness, let's check, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, the, the doctor in me is like, I'm certain you're menopausal, but I need to make sure we're not missing something, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, some other Beautiful. medical condition. Yeah, I think because I think it's tricky, you know, especially, you know, the, the Internet, social media world of like inflammation. We kind of just like toss this term around and it's mm-hmm. like, can we actually measure it? Can we actually see a change with diet? And from what you're telling me is like our labs aren't great, but yeah, we They're can. They're not great. We can They're see. They're non-specific. There's kind of general things. And then we can see it go down. Like I've, I've followed markers down just with nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, just with my usual and HRT. Yeah. So. Perfect. Um, do you know much about fatty liver and that going up in menopause and hor- I, cause I just so, I see so many I know people, it goes, you know, it is definitely a condition that goes up with menopause, but it is highly, highly, highly treatable with nutrition changes. Um, I've talked to the hepatologist. Um, I have, you know, a lot of my patients will come in, especially if they're overweight with mild fatty liver disease, just mildly elevated liver function testing and the ultras, you know, they've had their ultrasounds and whatever. And then their doctors, the local ones will send them to me to work on the nutritional part. And we've been able to get those levels down. So amazing. I mean, I see a lot. It's usually, Yeah. I was going to say, they come to see me for whatever urology thing is going on. And like their CAT scan says fatty liver. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. this is the number one cause of liver dysfunction in our society right now. And I'm like, is anybody talking to you about your fatty liver? Should they be talking to you about your fatty liver? Like, it's not good, right? I mean, most docs, because of the lack of, you know, I didn't have this kind of training. I went back to school to learn about nutrition, um, you know, 
at Tulane. I got the culinary medicine certification and I would not be comfortable. I mean, we were just like, go home, eat healthy. It was like porn, you know, when you see it, you know? And so that's, that's basically all we got was, you know, the only nutrition plan I had ever seen in my four years of training residency and my 20 years of practice was a gestational diabetic diet. That was it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the only time, and it was just something literally pulled out of a filing cabinet that had been mimeographed 27 times. It was barely legible. And it was the same one probably for 20 years that we were just hand to patients. Here's your diabetic gestational diabetic diet. Yeah. My husband's had, um, elevated cholesterol a couple of years ago and he got a diet from his doctor. It was basically like eat more onions. And, and like, I was like looking at this put and I'm like, this is not sustainable. We are not just going to start eating more onions. And I don't think that's going to be the, I mean, there was other things on there, but I was just like, ah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much science is behind this, but I, I mean, I love your book for the anti-inflammatory part of it. Cause I see day in and day out, irritated, inflamed, pissed off bladders. I look in there, you can see it, you can see how red it is. And I tell women, I'm like, clean up your diet, get rid of all the processed stuff. If only fluid is water and coming back and see me in three months. But I don't have a resource of like, I'm like, basically I go Google an anti-inflammatory diet, but I just started doing this and they'll, they'll come back in three months and they'll be like, my bladder symptoms are so much better and my arthritis is better and my skin mm -hmm. is better. Like it works. You know, a great resource for your listeners, one of the first websites I kind of stumbled on that has some of the most, the best evidence-based information is arthritis.org. They are all in for the anti-inflammatory diet. And I was like, whoa, you know, because I Googled, when I first started down this path, I was Googling like everybody else, you know, and I kept coming across their articles and they are a gold mine of information. I mean, thank you. And That's have be great. wonderful resources for and anybody, you know, there and um, highly, highly. And it's just arthritis.org. And they just really have a great nutrition program there. Amazing. Let's talk about supplements. I get a little cringy mm -hmm. on the supplements that are marketed to midlife women. And this is going to oh help. Oh, my God. Your, your I just did a TikTok about and, this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I know you're, you're with me. And so I'm like, I'm so cringy against like the specific marketing supplements. But and. There is something to, if you're going to pick supplements, there's something to fiber. There's something to magnesium. Yeah. There's something to vitamin D. There's something to oh, omega-3s. Yes. So I'm like, I can't be totally anti-supplement because I think there, we've got some good data. Our diets don't always give us enough of all of this. Can you talk right. about those you know, sure. that, that I mentioned and, and kind um, of your, your feeling on them? So here's what I learned in my nutrition studies. My, the head professor said, nobody ever got fat eating fruits and vegetables. <laughs> This was like his pearl, his first pearl. The second was you can't supplement your way out of poor nutrition. You can't swallow a handful of pills and think it's going to undo nutritional choices that are not serving you. That's not how it works. You supplement a healthy diet. The end. And so there are people who cannot get what they need from food because of location, because of cost, because of food deserts, because of allergies, you know, intolerances. Fine. Now. You need to work hard to get everything you need from food, but that's not always possible or practical, and we can supplement the gaps, okay? So um, the average American woman right now in the U.S. is getting about 12 grams of fiber in her diet per day. We and the need rec recommended is 20, 25, 25. yeah. 25. 25 minimum. I pushed for 35 with my own diet um, because of family history and stuff like that. And it makes me feel better. Um, so I'm a big fan to make sure you're getting enough fiber and supplementing a gap that you can't hit consistently. Okay. Um, second thing is um, vitamin D. 80% of my patients are deficient, severely deficient in vitamin D. That is a tough one to get. We're not getting enough sun because we're protecting our skin, understandably. We absorb less as we get older, and it is such an important hormone. Vitamin D is a hormone, you know, in the body that has multiple organ systems, um, everything from hair loss to weight gain to brain function to sexual function, all of it. And so I'm a big fan of supplementing vitamin D. Everybody asks how much. You, know, you can safely probably take four to 5,000 a day without becoming toxic. This is a fat storage um, vitamin, you know, hormone. And so it is something that we can become toxic. K, A, D, and E are, are vitamins that are stored in fat cells. So you, you can build up a lot of them. The other vitamins and minerals, 
we pee out every day. It is very hard without an IV to, or, you know, just some extraordinary situation to become toxic on magnesium or um, potassium orally, okay, Be, and with functioning kidneys. So um, because we will just pee out what our body doesn't need on a day-to-day basis. So, um, but that being said, magnesium, about 50% of us are not getting enough mag and it is crucial to brain function. And so everyone's like, what magnesium is the best? And I'm like, it depends on what you're treating. And so some are better to treat constipation, poor bioavailability stays in the gut, makes you poop, you know? Others are great at raising low levels, magnesium glycinate, uh, citrate. Those are all great for that. I, for If you're treating something in the brain, most of those studies are done with magnesium L-theronate called Neuromag or Magteen commercially, and that's the one that seems to cross the blood-brain barrier the best. So when I'm recommending it to help with sleep, to help with um, you know depression, to help with anything in the brain, I'll usually recommend that one. Um, now, mag is special in that you can take it in super physiologic doses and actually get a medicinal benefit, not like vitamin C. Everyone's like, oh, taking massive amounts of vitamin C to like help them with their immunity. No, a deficiency in C will lead to an immune deficiency, but taking it will not give you immune superpowers in large doses. So, you know, that's kind of where the nuances are in understanding. So, um, Mag. Uh, I do take an omega-3 supplement as well. I wish I could get salmon in my diet every day or fatty fish, but it's just really hard. It's such a powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. So I do supplement with that. Um, now you, right now the internet is blowing up at least my, my for you page and all my ads are all about these miracle cures for menopause. These marketers are smart. They know that this is a hot topic. They know that there are multiple pain points. And you'll see, I saw a woman crawling across the floor in pain, holding up a bottle of X, saying it's going to, this has changed my life. It's cured me. I'm like, look, and it's a probiotic. I'm like, I like probiotics. I take them myself because I'm not getting enough of my diet. Okay. But I know it is not curing all my menopausal symptoms. Okay. Mm-hmm. It might make my gut a little bit better. It, you know, I'm a fan, but you don't need to pay all this money and get this thing on subscription. It's amazing the, the just the audacity that these companies, and the, I can't believe the FDA is not like hot on this because they're making medical claim. You cannot make a medical claim on a supplement. The FDA will come after you, you know, and take know. it off the market. You can't so, call something a lube without the FDA and coming, getting on you. Millions. Yeah, millions. Millions. Save your and I'm, I'm always like, save your money, people. Save your money. Save mm-hmm. your money. Spend it on spend it on healthy, good quality food. Here's um, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Dude, I saw this supplement the other day. I kid you not. It says takes a while for it to work, so you got to take it for a while. <laughs> like they're literally telling you to keep buying it because eventually it's gonna work. Yeah, I'm you're like, just not trying hard enough. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I think another thing of anything that says may support may support is a warning sign. Hmm. Like, yeah, 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 probably not. Um, have you heard of this supplement? This was, this was new to me, but you you are a little more in the menopause. Uh, DIM, supplement called DIM. So diendolomethane, D-I-M. There, okay, you do, you do know more than me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's DIM? DIM is diendolomethane. It is the part of, it's found in cruciferous vegetables, okay? Um, so Brussels sprouts and uh, anything crunchy in the vegetable family will have some, some DIM in it. So what was found was that women who had diets rich in cruciferous vegetables had less breast cancer. And someone immediately went to the conclusion that that's because of this DIM component in the veggie. And, um, so if you take a lot of of this, you're not going to get breast cancer. Well, that's not true. Um, you know, when you eat a vegetable, there's multiple things in the vegetable. There's fiber, there's DIM, there's other minerals, nutrients, there's lots of things to support a healthy immune system, which is going to fight off breast cancer. So just pulling one extract out. Now, it does seem to shift the metabolic pathway of estrogen. So I see claims that it'll lower your estrogen, you should take DIM. Certainly, if you have had breast cancer, probably not a bad idea. It may not do a darn thing. It's not going to hurt you. But, you know, if you want a 1% or 2% in the chance that you're not going to recur, fine, take it. But I see people being blanket recommended it. And I, I don't, I've literally, I'm like, okay, like where are the, I go to PubMed. I look it up. Nothing. 
no research articles supporting its use for curing all these diseases that they say it's going to cure. So I never recommend it. I never, ever, ever recommend it. And I, when patients yeah. come in and they've been told to take it, I'm like, get off of it. Unless you've had breast cancer and your oncologist recommended it, then fine. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That's good. What about I, you and DHEA? You're probably corner in this market. Oh, That's D another DHEA? Uh-huh. DHEA in the vagina is excellent. It converts to estrogen and testosterone. That's fine. And the vagina does that. It's got the That's vagina. That's the only studies I've seen that were yep. positive were for vaginal use. Yep. And an oral DHEA, there's actually some harm studies in women who take more than 50, I think it's 50, don't quote me, 50 milligrams a day. There's actually harm studies in it. So people want it as like this natural you know, don't take estrogen, take DHEA. Don't take, you don't need testosterone. You can just take DHEA in the theory that DHEA is converting to these things and is therefore somehow superior. But as soon as I saw like harm studies in women, I'm like, I can't tell anybody to take DHEA. Mm -mm. I tell them to throw it away. Yeah. Don't take it. Same. Don't it's, take great. It. it's great in the vagina. Saw, and the, the studies that were done vaginally were on cancer patients who they were worried about giving estrogen. So DHEA was kind of a, panacea for women who couldn't take estrogen. Well, it turns out they're not going to get cancer from est vaginal estrogen. So just give them vaginal estrogen. Yeah. If yeah, yeah. You're trying to treat, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's some conditions that do benefit from the, the testosterone that it gets that you right. Cause the vulva is testosterone and estrogen uh, responsive. So I think some people are getting better than just estrogen because they're getting that testosterone from it. Okay. But you can also get a compounded testosterone estrogen cream or if you want. So there's multiple options. But yeah, oral, I do I do not like the data. I think there's Me I think either. there's a harm risk. The way I say it to patients, I haven't seen enough compelling evidence to convince me to have you spend fifty dollars on this bottle. That's, That's right. gonna make a difference. It's expensive. Um, what's your have you played with a continuous glucose monitor yet? I just got one delivered. <laughs> I haven't put it on yet. Uh, so I'm out of town. Um, I'm in New Orleans. It just arrived today. You're celebrating right now. You might not want the information. Yeah, this is not the you. weekend for me to put it on. <laughs> it's going to give you information you may not want to look at. I'm on the New Orleans diet, not the Galveston diet. Yeah. This <laughs> for, yeah, for people who are listening who don't know what it is, it continues glucose monitors. But you, if you follow anybody on the internet, especially like the athlete people, you'll see them put this on basically on your tricep. And Rumor has it, these are coming over the counter non-prescription in about two years. So price mm -hmm. should be dropping. It's, it's, you know, it is still pretty expensive to get one. Um, there's multiple companies on the internet. You can go sign up and get your continuous glucose monitor. Um, I wanted it because of the data on elevated glucose being a risk factor for all cars, mortality and cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I was also very curious about Western medicine. We're so good at treating the disease right? But we're not good at keeping the healthy people healthy. And right. what if we could know that our glucose was elevated before it turned into diabetes, before it turned into ca cardiovascular disease, right? So that was kind of my curiosity on it. I did it for about a month. I'm doing, I think I'm getting it delivered. Like every, I was not act. this podcast is the first time people are hearing me because I did not post on social media about it. The fee real time feedback that it gives you on what you are consuming and what it does to your in, your glucose is profound, and I think there's so much knowledge from it. I'm not so, telling everybody that they should do it, but I'm just saying that they should do it. Yeah, it's a like what white white rice does to my glucose. It, I might as well eat a Snickers bar. It's insane. So. I think it's going to also highlight how biodiverse we really are and that right. you and I could eat identical foods throughout the day and have completely different blood glucose monitoring. And like, it really is going to show you how your body reacts to blah, 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 you know, yeah. um, to different food substances where it would not affect my husband or my kids. But for me, I'm running a very dangerous level. I mean, I diabetes, well, you know, insulin resistance runs hard and fast in my family. So I know I'm kind of skirting the line. I was very close to being gestational diabetic. My sister was gestational <laughs> diabetic. So I know, and I have PCOS. So I know insulin resistance is something that is, I'm just going to have to work, do my best to work mm -hmm. around. So I'm excited to play with this monitor. And see. Oh man, I can't wait for your text <laughs> messages with your insights going off. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so insightful. Like, you know, how much just overeating, like eating more of this spikes versus a smaller amount of it or eating something mm -hmm. combined with a protein to, to decrease, you know, the, the gut transit time 
or mm -hmm. like so much information there that it's really, really helpful of like, oh, it's good to know. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's fun. It's, it's fun. It's not for everybody. It's still very expensive. We don't know, right? Like we don't know a lot about st healthy people. Um, but I think the data on elevated glucose and my brother actually threw one on, he does have elevated glucose. And so he's actually working on getting it down. But the data on elevated glucose and inflammation, breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, it's an amazing tool to give you insight into kind of how you're spending your day because you don't know, short of pricking right. your finger, right? That I'm cool. I was, I was like, I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to see what you think about this. So the company excited. reached out to us a few times and I thought hard about it. You know, I haven't signed a contract. I'm not, you know, they just were like, take it as a gift, play with yep, it and then give it. us your honest feedback. So yeah, I didn't pay um, for it. I'm excited for you. That's great. Um, one more thing I want to talk about is this amazing data that's starting to come out. I just learned about this, but like the role of decreasing estrogen on gut permeability. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the role of the gut in like bone health. And I'm like reading this yeah. stuff and I'm like, this is new to me. So this is going to be a huge part of my new book. Um, I just was screenshotting some articles <laughs> on how declining estrogen affects our gut microbiome and then how those changes in the gut microbiome affect our health on multiple different levels. And so let me find it. Um, basically, our, bi our gut biodiversity as we go through the menopause transition approaches that of a man. Okay. And so, and so that they, they're theorizing that that is why our risk of cardiovascular disease through the menopause transition escalates to that of a man. They're really thinking like a lot of scientists are right now it's that gut? It, the gut is everything. It's not arteries. And you know, it starts in the gut and then goes from there. And Fascinating. so, um, they actually followed these women where is, I did, I screenshot it cause I was going to do a TikTok about it. Um, but it's a little, you know, it's funny. TikTok has changed the algorithm and it's Instagram is where I'm living now. <laughs> Dude, so I deleted my, I deleted my TikTok two weeks ago. Uh, I'm, official, I'm officially more interested in what I have TikTok. to say now on Instagram. So yeah, this is menopause, the gut microbiome. <laughs> so yeah, I was just reading yes. this guy. Look at I know that. it's backwards. Weight gain correlation or causation. So it was a really fascinating article and you know we need more research but it is really kind of outstanding and there was a second one spotlight on the gut microbiome and menopause current insights basically coming to the same conclusion we're seeing a dramatic shift in our gut microbiome so women who are complaining of bloating women who are complaining of you know sudden constipation worsening ibs you know anything gut related like you know it's your gut what you don't realize is that your gut is then affecting other parts of your body, your brain, your health, you know, and that it's your all bone, your bones, apparently interrelated, how you are breaking down estrogen, how you are metabolizing calcium, how you are like, everything is related. And so why our health suddenly d decreases dramatically, you know, we're kind of steady state getting, and then all of a sudden it's like boop, in the menopause transition. All these links are happening in my brain. So Women's Health Initiative showed that women who are on estrogen had decreased risk of colon cancer. And they said, we really don't know why. But if it's gut microbiome and inflammation, that might be the reason why. That's that. Yeah. So um, hopefully we'll get we'll see some studies on that directly. That is so cool. Yeah, it was it was blowing me away. I was like, do women have a higher rate of irritable bowel syndrome going up through the menopause transition? I have to look at that one. We yeah. have a higher rate of almost everything else <laughs> going through menopause transition, you know, everything from orthopedic, you know, joint, bone and joint issues. You just did, I, a, fro you just did a frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder. And, you know, these are things that social media has taught me. This is not something I learned in my training. You know, we're just focused on the pelvis and the breasts. And... All of a sudden, I had multiple people asking me about frozen shoulder across multiple social media platforms. Could there be a correlation? Because it started in my 40s. Pretty much, I've learned that any disease process that we see a sudden increase in women beginning in their late 30s, early 40s, yes, it is related to menopause. Right. So, irritable it's good bowel. To know. It's good because I, I'm like, so, I just feel like a hammer. In, you know, yeah. like. I feel like a hammer in the world's a nail because I'm like, yeah, it's probably perimenopause. Yeah, it's probably menopause. But like, in truth, it probably is. There is an article and I haven't done, I haven't done an Instagram or a podcast on it yet, but it's looking at a shoulder replacement 
and your risk of needing a shoulder replacement in both men and women who have low hormones. So men who are hypotestosterone and women who are hypoestrogen both have a higher rate of needing your shoulder replaced. So like the stuff coming out of ortho is pretty fascinating. Um, and now, I mean, only 2%, is it 98% are, are of orthopedic surgeons are male, but the, the 2% of women are fighting real hard. And the, the frozen shoulder data came out of Duke and it was a, a collaboration between the department of OBGYN and the Saw department that. of orthopedic surgery. And I was like, that's I mean, you and I growing up in medicine are like, what? We never talked to I each know. other. I'm like, I'm like unless I'm there like, was did, a trauma patient. Did you patient sit next to pregnant. each other? And, yeah. Like, did you happen to have lunch one day? Like, how did you get together? I'm like, how did this happen? <laughs> totally. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I was looking through my past podcast. This is our third one together. The mm-hmm. first one was episode three, where mm-hmm. I, you did, just started. I did a live on the Galveston Diet Facebook group. Mm-hmm. Way back when. And people Way still comment when. on that damn video. Yeah. I mean, you're changing lives. Changing so are lives. you. I'm so That's glad crazy. that I'm, truthfully, I'm so glad I'm not alone. Like it's the power, mm-hmm. it's the power of like having friends who see what you're doing is not crazy. And I feel like you provide that support for me. Hopefully I provide that support for you. Of oh, like, you're not same. crazy doing what yeah, you're doing. I'm like, like as long as go. Kelly's not calling me out on something, I'm doing okay. Cause you would tell me. <laughs> What are you doing, totally Ava? Would. Yeah, well, I hope you would do the same. So thank you so much for being in this space. Like our work will never be done. This is 50% mm-hmm. of the population. It's. It, it, I was talking to somebody today, just going from like estrogen causes cancer to neutral to it's actually beneficial. Like we're, it's like this huge, huge mindset I've change. I've lived that through we the do. pendulum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. And, and I think the next, if I'm going to predict into the future, I think the next pendulum is there's 5 million breast cancer survivors. The number one reason they die is heart disease. They have hot flashes and osteoporosis. And I know some who are on hormones now. And I think the pendulum's switching. And I can say this with confidence because we did it with prostate cancer and testosterone. And I just, so, and that's already happened. There is a woman who works for MIDI and is it MIDI or Alloy? She works for one of the Alloy. online. Um, Katrina. It's the Minnow doc. Yeah. The, um, Dr. Min, Min. Yep, Min. Anyway, I she had breast me, cancer really young. She's a survivor mm-hmm. and is one of the best educators on this topic that I have ever seen. And she is such a proponent of estradiol. You know, um, I've not asked her, are you on it personally? You know, because she is a young survivor and they are so much higher risk yeah. for multiple disease states. When we have They're to castrate a female right. young, you know, and, and people get sent on their way, I mean, we're just you know, and we've known for years, they're, they're going to die early. They're going to have all these problems, but no one's talking about it. And now, you know, removing your ovaries is not recommended till age 65 if they're healthy. Mm-hmm. So if you're going in for a hysterectomy routinely at, in their fifties, I would remove their ovaries. That's what I was taught. You know, it's going to, it's we're decreasing your risk of ovarian cancer, da, 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 da. Turns out we were shortening their lives and their quality of life. Yep. Medicine changes people and we got to, we got to stay caught up to it. The other yeah. the thing that the ob guidance taught me on that is removing the fallopian tubes is what decreases your risk of ovarian risk cancer, of ovarian cancer, not yeah. the ovaries. Fascinating. Um, yep. just for, for the listeners, Dr. Corinne men, M E N N and she's Dr. Yes. Men ob guy on Instagram. I think she's up and coming. I think she's on our coattails and she's going to start getting into this advocacy hot and heavy and I'm happy to have her. Yeah. She's amazing. Very cool. Well, you, we can find you on TikTok. We can still, unless you quit just like me. Um, we I can, can find quit, you on Instagram. I'm, really You're not kind quit. Of, I'm getting more love from Instagram, Instagram right now. Instagram are my people. Kind of my ladies are on I'm Instagram. Mm-hmm. I, I have a high Instagram bias. Um, and then the Galveston Diet, books out. It's doing incredibly books well. Out. They actually ran mm-hmm. out of books. Did they I get did. that right? Yeah, you ran out of books. <laughs> well, that that's is not a problem every, book- every author has. One no, well, also it's the same the same publisher as Prince Harry's book came out on the same day, so I think that the printers were a little more concerned with his million books instead of my forty thousand. So my publishers never said that <laughs> out loud, but I was like doing the math, carry the one. I'm like, eh, I know where I'd. <laughs> you know where the paper's going. We're back in stock. You can get them now. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, enjoy where you are in New Orleans. Enjoy the New Orleans diet for this weekend. I'm so glad yeah. you gave, gave me the time. I, I love hanging out with you. We'll do it in person someday. I know. It'll be awesome. Our, our paths will cross. Thank you very much. 
appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. Always, always a pleasure.